first one too. All right, I was just informed that I'm between you and lunch, so we'll start now. Um, all right, my name is Brandon Phillips. Uh, I'm the CTO and co-founder of CoreOS, and I am here to talk to you a little bit about a project that we started called Rocket. I provided the URL um, right there, so you can look at the project right now, because I know half of the audience will be just wanting the URL. So there you go, there's a README, please check it out. Um, if you don't want to read the README right now, I'll talk about what we're actually doing with this project. <clears throat> so uh, Rocket, um, we shorten it to RKT, um, because many good Unix commands are three letters, cat, git, uh, vim, and uh, Rocket. And so um, I'm getting a little like, tap when I aspirate. <clears throat> Should I lower the mic? No worries. <clears throat> Give it a go. Okay, thanks. Um, and this is a single static binary um, that brings all of the things necessary to run Rocket together into a single uh, thing that you can run on your machine. Um, so it runs on every platform with a modern Linux kernel. Uh, and uh, we've tested it on, of course, CoreOS. Um, it also runs on Ubuntu and Fedora. Uh, there's a bunch of rumors that were going around when we started this project that it only runs on System D systems, which is incorrect. Um, so in fact, I'm going to be doing all of my demos from a Vagrant uh, Ubuntu VM just to prove my point that this is, this is not a uh, CoreOS specific thing. <clears throat> All right, so uh, it all begins with Rocket Fetch. Um, Rocket Fetch does a few different things. Um, it downloads and discovers images uh, over the internet. Um, and the goal of this uh, is to um, make this a non-privileged operation um, so that you can run Rocket Fetch as a, uh, a non-root user. Um, and then it can use either uh, discovery uh, images um, or discover URLs, which I'll talk about in a moment, or, or direct HTTP URLs. So you can host uh, the images that you run under Rocket on a regular HTTP server, Nginx or S3 or anything like that. Uh, there's no uh, registry or special software required to do that. In fact, we do adorable little tricks so that even image discovery uh, doesn't require a special registry. Again, I'll talk about that in the next section of the talk, which is about the specification uh, behind Rocket. Uh, and then the next piece is Rocket Run. Um, and so Rocket Run uh, takes whatever the HTTP URL is and actually runs it as a process on your machine. Um, so uh, one of the major design things that we decided to do with Rocket is that we wanted it to be a direct descendant of the process uh, that executed um, Rocket. So in the case of running it for the command line, it's bash, Rocket, and then your application. Uh, in the case of running it under your init system, whatever it might be, um, it directly executes uh, the container. This is important because we found that a lot of people are, um, are having a little trouble uh, with Docker and integrating it with their existing init systems. Um, and then also we uh, have kind of a bootstrapping problem within CoreOS uh, where we want to run certain uh, things under a container, but we need to configure the networking daemon, for example, to be aware of uh, uh, configure like an overlay network, um, and then we need to configure the Docker daemon. And we, need, we want the overlay network software to be running in a container itself, um, but we have this bootstrapping problem of we need to configure the Docker daemon using a container, um, which is external to the Docker daemon. Otherwise, we end up with multiple Docker daemons to configure the Docker daemon, um, which is not good. Um, so uh, Rocket, as I said, executes directly under the process. Um, <clears throat> And in practice, uh, the rocket run command lines look something like this, where it's um, rocket run, and then uh, say coreos.com slash etcd, and then a version uh, number. And again, this is um, this magic uh, where we take this URL and actually transform it and discover the, Ur the HTTPS URL of the image um, is done all statically. <clears throat> um, rocket is uh, divided up into a few stages. Actually, um, let me skip ahead. I think I've now gotten myself a little disorganized here. Um, so in the case of Rocket and, and um, all these, uh, uh, and the specification that we're talking about, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a number of, of processes and execute them inside of a container. Um, how many here are familiar with Kubernetes or the concept of pods? Okay. so. Um, so what we wanted to do with containers, that's okay. 
Uh, what we wanted to do with the uh, containers that run under, under Rocket is we want to be able to do things like run multiple processes inside of a single container that's launched. Um, so you could imagine, say, you're running a database server and you want to have the actual database process, say Postgres, and then you also want to have uh, a process in that container that's backing up the database server, say to S3 periodically, or replicating that wall file off to a, a hot um, <clears throat> follower uh, who may take over in case of hardware failure. Um, so the idea is that within a single container, you can be executing multiple processes. Um, and so uh, you can imagine if you're running etcd again, um, you're running etcd and then you have something that's backing up etcd and then maybe also doing an HTTP health check that is on a loop um, and sending you an email in case etcd is misbehaving or has lost quorum. Um, so this is the idea of, of Rocket, is that you run a container, but that container has, mul that container has multiple applications, uh, multiple processes inside of it. Okay. Um, so uh, the Rocket binary itself is divided up into uh, various stages. Um, the first stage is what we call stage zero, which is the actual um, binary that you download from GitHub. Uh, and this downloads the image and sets up the root file system of the, of the image that you've downloaded over the internet, verifies the image if you have, uh, if you have GPG keys that you trust for certain software, um, and, and does all that, uh, essentially talking to the internet. And hopefully, um, if we design this whole thing right, we can use Unix permissions so this all happens as non-root. Um, at some point, it needs to execute as root um, in order to do the kernel setup of namespaces and cgroups. <clears throat> and um, this is the next stage, which we call stage one. Um, currently in Rocket, uh, stage one executes a, um, a systemd uh, init system. So it, um, it, it has a PID1 that's actively monitoring all the processes within the containers and setting up those namespaces. And we use uh, systemd. But um, other implementations have been prototyped and people are working on, um, you can imagine, enclosing the container in a QMU, KVM uh, process instead of a systemd process, or using another init system like Runit or uh, sorry, if you're interested in doing that. Um, but the idea is that within the container, you, within the container you have an actively monitoring uh, process that's monitoring the, the, um, all the, the applications that are running inside of it. Um, and then stage two is the actual interesting bit, which is where it's executing your Postgres application, your backup Postgres application, all these things inside. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you can do things like attach restart policies. So say your Postgres backup application crashes, you can say restart it, attempt to restart it. Um, every 100 milliseconds, if it fails to restart, um, after five attempts, then uh, then kill it. I'll just not aspirate any words. Um, and so uh, and so you can essentially say what things are required to be running within the containers and, and set policies up for uh, for tearing down the container if um, if things happen uh, that are unexpected. <clears throat> And then after the processes have all exited, uh, you're optionally allowed to, uh, or you're given the ability to garbage collect. And since Rocket doesn't have a daemon, um, we have a, a command line subcommand called Rocket GC, um, which you could imagine running on a periodic timer or a cron job or something uh, that goes through and garbage collects um, uh, file systems for containers that uh, are no longer needed. Um, and you can set whatever policy you'd like on that sort of garbage collection. Um, but it, it's not a, a daemon that's act actively monitoring these container file systems. All right, so uh, <coughs> Rocket is an implementation of a specification that we've worked on with a number of uh, people. <coughs> um, we've had contributions from folks at like SoundCloud and, sorry. Sorry, oh, no worries. Um, test one, two. We've had uh, people helping us out um, on this spec from <clears throat> various companies, uh, but the idea is that uh, we wanted to um, we wanted to kind of define how uh, containers should be put together, um, particularly these containers that have multiple processes within inside of them, 
and then um, enable people to have multiple implementations of, of this spec. Um, because we believe that the, the image and the runtime should be something that um, can be implemented by multiple, uh, multiple folks. For example, the Mesos project um, really is interested in executing containers as fast as possible. And they're willing to, uh, to put in the work to have um, optimize C++ code all over the place to do that, and they don't want to have a separate init system for every process. They want to have um, their own special tricks to make um, container execution uh, really fast. And so um, they don't want a general purpose container runtime. They want something built directly into Mesos. So um, you could imagine that they would want to take this spec and, uh, and write a library to, to do that directly. Um, and so uh, this spec is definitely a work in progress, and we're actively taking contributions from a number of folks. And um, uh, I encourage all of you to, to get involved. Um, the other thing is that it's not just a spec, but actually live code. And it generates containers that can verify a runtime. So these containers run various tests to ensure that it's, uh, its environment's set up properly, the file system's set up properly. It's able to communicate between two processes using the file system, et cetera, et cetera, and um, generates those containers. So when people update the spec, they have to update the code um, at the same time, uh, just to ensure that we actually are developing something that we transform from human thought into machine code, um, which is important. <laughs> Um, so there's a few uh, chunks of the spec. Um, the first is the actual image format. Um, and the image format essentially just contains all the files uh, for the root file system. And then a JSON uh, manifest that describes uh, the sort of constraints, the isolation that be, should be put on the application, um, and where to find uh, the, the, application, the, the process to execute. Um, this is all enclosed in a tar and optionally compressed with um, gzip, bzip, or, or xc. Um, and it's all addressed via a uh, transport URL. Um, <clears throat> so like coreos.com slash etcd would be an example of that. Um, and then uh, images can have dependencies on other images. So you can, um, you can imagine having an image that has all of your trusted certificate authorities um, that you trust inside of your environment and then including that um, into all of your uh, downstream images. Um, and that way you have detached the, um, you've detached where your certificates are managed away from the ap applications. So you can update that certificate, um, that certificate set uh, outside of your applications. <clears throat> you could also use it for things such as like configuration, um, where you want to generate a configuration container that say, say has passwords or API keys um, to your environment. Uh, and then the runtime uh, has a number of things that it's in charge of. Uh, I mentioned that it monitors and restarts processes as they've died. Um, it can also execute one or more processes, um, one or more apps, and it can have a number of hooks that uh, as it responds to runtime events. Say, um, we've specified things such as you're doing a migration, and so you want to run some sort of, uh, some sort of process inside the container uh, before that migration happens. It may, say, deregister this container from a load balancer before spinning it back up, or notifies the build server that there's going to be an additional delay for this build to um, happen, those sorts of things. <clears throat> Um, and this is the diagram that I showed you earlier, but essentially the idea that you can have a container with multiple processes executing inside of it. Uh, the other piece that we thought was really important while we were thinking through this spec is we wanted to provide a metadata server um, specification. And the primary thing is that we wanted to have a way of extending trust um, and identity from the host down into the container. If you think about it, um, all of our Linux hosts have an identity that we trust. And that's generally the SSH server and the SSH key pair. Um, but we haven't defined that for processes. So individual processes on our machine don't have identity. Um, and this is a problem because a lot of our processes are network services, and um, they need to gather resources from other network services. And so we wanted to have a very minimal um, signing and verification uh, metadata server so that a process could make a network call um, to an IP address and port um, that is trusted, uh, that it's given via an environment variable, 
and then be able to verify uh, using cryptography the identity of other processes um, that may be making network requests. And it's essentially a bare minimum um, <clears throat> HMAC service uh, where the process doesn't have access to the private key um, that's being used. Uh, so the, identi the identity server and the metadata server I thought uh, I think are rather fundamental things that exist in other large organizations but we haven't really defined as a community um, for the processes yet. Um, uh, the other piece is the image discovery piece. So uh, coros.com slash etcd um, is the name of, of the application container image, but it, it's not actually hosted at coros.com. It's hosted at github.com slash wada wada slash releases. Um, and so uh, what we do is we've defined a um, HTTP um, HTML head section, um, a meta section, so that you can say, if you're looking, so it makes a query to coros.com, it looks in the head section of the HTML at coros.com, says, okay, uh, there's a discovery location for this container name, and it says that it's over at GitHub. And so we can redirect you to S3 buckets or anything like that. Um, just how, very similar to how uh, Golang does their stuff. So when, um, when you have a Golang package, you can say, hosted on your personal domain, example.com, um, but the actual bits are hosted at github.com. Um, but the canonical name is example.com. Um, and that's, that's how we have built uh, the image discovery process. So it looks something like this within the, the meta tag of, on your HTML pages. Um, it's uh, templated using one of the RFC templating languages. So it's like github.com slash version, whatever. <clears throat> uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, there's this not just code, or it's not just a, a human readable spec. There's actual code to back it up, and we have a tool called AC Tool that can do things like build, um, validate, and discover images, uh, so that you can ensure that as we add additional implementations of this app container spec, um, that they actually all play together nicely and uh, conform to the spec as it evolves. All right, so uh, the two projects um, are at github.com slash coros slash rocket and then github.com slash appc slash spec. Um, I'm going to go through and do a few demos really quick uh, just so that we have a concrete idea of what we're talking about here and then um, we'll call it a show. So um, do I have any, any quick questions before I dive into demos? Okay. I will, um, let's see, is this being recorded? Is this being recorded? Okay. Um, well, I'll tr could somebody hold the microphone actually for me? It's going to be really hard to type. <laughs> okay. Um, so, as I said, this is everyone. See? Okay, good. Uh, so this is an Ubuntu machine uh, running Rocket. Of course, it could be CoreOS or anything else. Um, and so, uh, what we can do here is I can do. Um, Okay, so I can say things like uh, sudo rocket run um, uh, coros.com slash etcd, and then I can give it an explicit version tag. And this is, uh, one of the things in the specification is that you can have an arbitrary number of tags. So you can imagine saying like uh, canary equals true and environment uh, equals equals NZ or whatever. Um, but the, the two tags are name and version, and we have a, a shorthand for that. Um, and what, what this does is it'll go off uh, to the internet and actually download the image and, and um, discover where the, uh, the image is hosted, if I have internet. <clears throat> that might be a problem. You can get internet right there. Oh, okay. But it's 30 minutes. Okay, well, okay. Um, so I guess I had an image cached on my machine and DNS timed out, so awesome. Uh, so what happened is that it went through um, and found, found the image and then launched it. And so this process is, uh, this etcd process is now running on my host. Um, similarly, I could have launched uh, this container um, using uh, an HTTP, HTTP um, URL. So 
this, this is the image that was, would have been discovered via the discovery process, um, github.com slash coreOS at CD releases, download, et cetera, et cetera. And so this template was filled out um, after downloading the homepage of coreOS.com and stripping out that head thing. Um, and so this, this will work similarly um, because we, we add a bunch of secondary indexes um, based on the crypto hash of the image, based on the HTTP URL it was downloaded from, and then from the discovery uh, URL slug, coreos.com slash etcd. So there's various ways of, of addressing the image based on essentially your security stance. Um, the crypto hash is obviously the most secure. Um, if you want to write down in a, in a configuration file or something, uh, run this image, obviously you want it to run from the crypto hash because that's the actual image that you want to be running. Um, and then uh, the other nice thing about the specification and how this stuff works is that um, I'm running a uh, the Python um, simple HTTP server uh, on this host also. And uh, I, I'm able to host the ACI over there um, without the the use of any, any any fancy registry software or something, and we can kind of cruise through the um, the format of the um, of the ACI. So I'll re remove these things. So uh, the ACI is a um, a regular tarball. Um, so it's you can extract it using tar, and um, it has a uh, a JSON manifest. Um, that has some pretty simple sections to it. So the the manifest is versioned and has a kind and all that stuff, um, but then it has an application section, which is an optional section describing how the application is actually to be ran. And it's the usual things that you'd expect, environment variables, uh, mount points, that sort of stuff. And then um, this is where we get into the, the labels. Um, where you can define what operating system it's supposed to be uh, targeted for, what the architecture is, um, what the name of it is, and um, the, the, the version. <clears throat> and um, the, the reason this app section is optional is because, as I mentioned, you may have uh, uh, cont container images that are just configuration or just uh, like SSH or SSL uh, certificate authorities that you, that you trust. And then the rootfs itself is what you'd expect. It contains um, the actual binaries that are executable, and then uh, like you know an empty Etsy host file. Uh, so that's that's the basic format and layout of the of the app container images themselves. Um, and this this format is pretty um, concrete at this point, but we're uh, interested in adding new formats. Um, one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm interested in is extending uh, the tarball format to uh, be streaming so that you could imagine that you could stream uh, the image uh, using a fuse file system and launch a container before the container has actually been downloaded. Um, and that's something that we've started to spec, spec out. Um, and this is this has got some interesting um, challenges because uh, tar is probably the worst format ever made um, by humanity, um, and it's not really anybody's fault. It's just uh, how it evolved. Um, but uh, it it doesn't really have um, the properties that you need for a streaming format. So you end up having to create a secondary index and then signing that secondary index. Um, and it's a bit of an interesting problem, particularly when you consider that uh, what we do with these tar files is that we compress them, um, which kind of scatters the problem even further. Um, because we have no top level section of the file that we can expect to have all the metadata. Um, so we need to download blocks all over the place and then uncompress those blocks in order to find where the metadata is. Um, so if anyone has some great ideas or an alternative file format to tar that's been more or less standardized uh, across a bunch of tooling, I'm open to suggestions and no zip doesn't work. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the specification and Rocket in a nutshell. So I have five minutes left, and I'm happy. Thank you for holding the mic. Um, and I have five minutes left for questions. Because you're closest. Um, so when you're running multiple, um, ep, uh, multiple processes, and do you just, like in that spec, you just create multiple things in the JSON for each one? Oh, well? yes, that's a great question. So. Um, there's, uh, there's two ways to do it. Essentially, you would add um, additional, 
well, I can't type. Anyways, essentially, like, uh, rocket run and then coreos.com slash etcd, and then space coreos.com slash etcd backer upper tool. And those would just be both specified on the command line. There's also a JSON format. If you have more complex requirements, say you have like you know three volumes that you need to be mounting, and you have some more complex network set up, and you need the containers to be isolated in a certain way from each other. Like one container gets a gig of RAM, and the other container gets two megs. Um, if you have that sort of level of complexity, doing it from the command line is really hard. So we punt to having you have to provide a JSON uh, document that describes the container that you actually want to be uh, running. Um, yeah. Uh, so to generate the ACI image, do you have a... Okay. Do you have any equivalent of a Docker file that, you know, you just one file and you give it and it generates the ACI from a, a tree? Uh, so we, we haven't done that. Um, and part of the reason we haven't done that yet is because we wanted to enable multiple ways of building things. Um, so people have built tools that take a Docker image and convert it to an ACI, which is sort of a trivial task from converting a JSON format to another JSON format and then flattening the image. Um, the, uh, but we, we wanted the spec to be kind of agnostic to how you build it because we think that there's a lot of interesting innovation that can happen around how images get built. Um, you can imagine language-specific tools like a Python-specific build tool that takes your, um, your requirements.txt file or whatever it's called um, and transforms that into a, a standalone container image. Um, and so uh, I think over time, we'll kind of see a proliferation of additional tooling. I think the Docker build stuff's great, um, but it has, uh, it has limitations. Um, and uh, particularly when you start to think about things like doing Go static binaries, um, you, the build process becomes uh, very, very simple and fast and can be done um, from hosts that aren't actually running the container runtime. For example, I can, I can build and cross-compile and, and build an ACI for a Go static binary on my OSX machine that runs just fine on my Linux host. Um, and so I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens there, and that's why we didn't define, say, how it gets built. We defined what the built asset sh should look like. And we, of course, are interested in evolving that um, to make sure that it meets everyone's requirements too. Um, the spec is, is definitely still under construction. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey, Matthew. Hey, um, so the spec describes you have support for PGP signing of images in order to verify provenance. Uh, is there any kind of support for chains of trust rather than merely a static list of keys? Um, so yeah, so like X509 chains of trust. Um, there's not right now. Uh, Essentially, I'd be happy to add something like that. Um, I think that people in general have an extremely hard time managing um, certificate authorities, and I'd like to see if we can do something better than like saying, yeah, just use the OpenSSL X509 tool, and then good luck. Um, so uh, I'm totally open to having a hierarchical thing. It's just I didn't feel like anything was the right answer right off the bat um, besides GPG. And we, there's kind of a history of using GPG for signing software um, so in the open source community. So I thought it was an OK thing to do. Totally willing to have the discussion, though, about what a better tool would be. Yeah. So the Docker sort of approach to um, managing containers is to have like a Docker engine. Mm. So it appears to me that you uh, have the opportunity with, with the spec to have a container managing an image and an image running potentially more than one process. The Postgres instance was a, was a good example of that. Mm. So in Postgres you have a number of child processes that are running logging and replication and what have you. Mm. So <clears throat> do you have or do you see separate engines or container runtimes for each image running uh, the container in their own process space? Yeah, so how it's implemented today, essentially every container has a PID1, um, which is a, a full init system. And so that PID1 is actively managing that container. Um, there's no API, though. So once the process gets launched, the process is, is launched. Um, so there's no API to say, stop this container. We rely on your existing init system to do that. Um, 
So in a way, there is a, an engine um, within the spec because we say that you have to actively monitor processes. Now, whether that means that it's implemented as Rocket is today, where there's a direct descendant of processes, or if it's implemented um, how like the Docker engine is implemented or LXC uh, is implemented, or LX, LXD is implemented, where there's um, a daemon that you talk to and then the processes exist under that. I think it's an implementation detail. Right, so you don't see multiple rocket instances running on a single host? There, there will always be multiple rocket instances running on a single host because of the fact of how it's, it's uh, how rocket works. Because rocket is, it's like bash or Python, like it executes as a child of wherever it was executed from. But you can imagine if, um, we'll call it uh, foobar for creativity, uh, if somebody implemented the app container spec in their foobar project, uh, you can imagine that there's a foobar D and there's only one of those per host and that actively monitors the set of processes that exist in a container. So there's only like one process monitor for that entire host um, for the foobar D. Um, it's just a, a difference in implementation design decision, whether it's a standalone uh, container runtime or whether it's a container runtime with a engine of some sort. Uh, yeah, one monitor, yeah, yes. Okay. I think there's, do we have time for one more? Sorry. One more. Well, uh, are you doing anything to, uh, to approach uh, storage problems that Docker have, like the attachable and the identifiable storage uh, volumes? Uh. Yeah, so there are, there's the concept of volumes and mount points within the spec. We decouple the two. So within the spec, uh, the runtime sets up a volume. Um, so that could be, a, we'll say, for example, a host volume, so a bind mount point. Um, and then uh, the containers have a set of, uh, the container images define a set of names and then uh, uh, destinations for those names. So say you have the backer upper tool, um, it just generically has a, a named mount point called backup. And you could point that at, say, var lib postgres or var lib mysql. And it doesn't really matter. The backer upper tool just knows that it needs to rsync some directory to some other host or S3 or whatever. So we've decoupled the concept of the volume from the mount point in which that volume is attached to the containers. And the, the, the API is that the mount points are stable names that the containers should hold on to across multiple versions, so backup name in this case, but it's okay if that backup directory is some, it's implementation specific uh, inside the container image. Okay. Make it quick. Uh, okay, uh, that's great. Uh, I only wanted to ask a little bit. Uh, can I use your um, discovery system uh, for volumes? Oh, so yes. Uh, for containers? Yes. So uh, you can use an image as a volume. So, yes. Cool. Lunch. Thanks. So, all right, I think we're uh, never good. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, thanks. And uh, just a quick FYI, Brandon and a couple of others uh, will be back at 425 for the, uh, the closing panel for this mini conf. Uh, now it's lunchtime. I think everyone's on their own for lunch, is that right? So I think everyone's on their own for lunch. We'll be back here at 120. Andrew Boag, or Bogue, my apologies for messing up your name, will be talking about AWS.